Today I'm going to be talking to you about camouflaging in autistic women. And um, just a disclaimer here, I am not a camouflaging researcher, um, but uh, I think this topic is really interesting, particularly with the panel and the audience that we have today. So I'm going to start out with talking about uh, some of the work in, in the field and what we're really focused on understanding in the past five or six years, for me in particular, are why are there fewer girls diagnosed with autism? This is one of the most consistent findings in the field of autism, that there is only about one girl diagnosed for every three to four boys with autism. And uh, one of the big questions in the field is why? And there are really two prevailing theories about this. I usually talk about the first one, which is a biological theory based in genetics uh, called the female protective effect. I'm not going to talk about that today. Instead, I'm going to talk about a behavioral theory about why there might be fewer girls diagnosed with autism. And that's really the, um, this idea that girls may be flying under the radar and going undetected or underdiagnosed. And part of what may be contributing to this is this notion that females with autism may camouflage their symptoms more than males and therefore be more difficult to detect um, either to be flagged to go be seen by a clinician or by clinicians themselves. So an outline of today's talk is that I want to give an overview of the current science on camouflaging. And here on the right on the graph is just, I did a quick uh, PubMed search of the number of scientific papers that had camouflaging and autism as keywords um, going back two decades. And you can see in the beginning in 2001, there were very few papers on camouflaging and autism, but there has been exponential growth, particularly in the past couple of years. In 2019, there were 12 papers published um, with these as keywords, and we're only halfway through 2020, and we're already about at 10 papers. I'm going to review some of the specific papers that um, have come out more recently and try to cover these different topics. What is camouflaging? How do we measure it? What do we know about sex and gender differences in, in camouflaging? I'll talk a little bit about the mental health consequences of camouflaging. I think that's really important to consider. There are a couple studies now trying to understand the neural basis of camouflaging. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and future directions facing the field as we continue to study camouflaging in all people with autism. So moving on, um, well, starting really, uh, what is camouflaging? And here I just want to point out um, some of the real experts in the field who are leading the research. These are the authors on the papers that I am going to be talking about today. Um, they are really pushing the field in trying to understand what camouflaging is better. So in their words, I thought I would describe what is camouflaging. So social camouflaging is the use of strategies by autistic people to minimize the visibility of their autism during social situations. You can also think of it as a coping strategy where an individual is hiding the behavior that may be viewed as socially unacceptable and artificially performing social behavior deemed to be more neurotypical. We also think about it in terms of compensation. So these are processes contributing to the improved behavioral presentation of a neurodevelopmental disorder, despite having persisting core deficits at the cognitive and or neurobiological levels. So basically camouflaging is, and I think of it as trying to put on your best quote normal, whatever that is. And then we're trying to understand the strategies uh, um, that people use to, to put on this best normal. And some very specific examples of camouflaging, we can break it down. Uh, this is work by Laura Hall and Will Mandy, um, talking about compensation, masking, and assimilation as different components or different coping strategies that can be used to camouflage behavior. And I find it nice to have an example of what these strategies are. So compensation being finding ways around things that are naturally difficult. An example would be forcing yourself to make eye contact with someone. So you're compensating for something that doesn't feel natural to you. Another uh, coping strategy that some people with autism might use is masking or hiding parts of your autism. So an example here would be not talking about something you're really interested in or hiding that part of, um, of what you want to talk about in a social interaction because you know it wouldn't be appropriate. And finally, there's this notion of assimilation, trying to fit in with everyone else 
so people don't notice that you're different. Um, this is really camouflaging. What I think about is camouflaging. And this is trying to force yourself to do things um, that are so-called neurotypical, talking to a stranger in a shop, even if you don't want to. So I think we can all sort of think about camouflaging. And I, and I think it's important here to also think about that while, we, while I'm talking today about camouflaging in autistic women, I think this is something that all of us do just to varying degrees. We all do things to, we all have coping strategies to sort of put on our best normal in a social interaction. And I think it's important to, to recognize that we all camouflage and it's not anything bad or intentional or we're not trying to deceive people, it's just something you do to have a normal social interaction. Here in this case, it could be that people with autism have to compensate a little bit more. So moving on to the next part, I wanted to talk about how do we measure camouflaging in autistic individuals. So it's all good to say what these things are, but it actually is quite tricky to measure camouflaging. Um, one of the methods that uh, is, uh, is out there is using something called a discrepancy method. And this is measuring the gap between how autistic a person is, that is their internal autistic status, versus their overt behaviors or their external autistic presentation. And this was a finding that was that actually came out of a paper published by Meng Chuan Lai, um, a good colleague and, and friend of mine, who was doing a behavioral comparison of males and females, adults with high functioning autism. And this actually was an unexpected result in his paper published back in 2011, but has gone on to um, warrant a, a, a whole number of studies um, coming out of this so using this discrepancy method. And basically what he found was this unexpected result that females showed fewer autistic symptoms, but they perceived having more autistic features than males. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. They came up with this camouflaging score. So in their next paper, they operationalized how to define camouflaging. And they simply took it as a, a, a difference, a discrepancy between how autistic somebody feels versus how autistic they present themselves. So that's this internal score versus the external score or the, the difference between those. And a higher score would mean that there's a larger gap or a discrepancy between how the indiv individual feels versus how they portray themselves. And so how did they do this in, in a laboratory setting? Well, using to, to try to get at this internal autistic status, they had participants, these are now adult participants, um, and, and all, of these, all of these slides I'll have the sample sizes over here. Um, I think that's a really important part when you're evaluating a study, just to see how big of a sample there is, as well as the ages here. Most of the research here has been done in adults. So the way that they measured the internal score or the internal autistic status um, in the first paper, the 2011 paper, was using something called the autistic spe spectrum quotient. It was a self-report of autistic traits. And they had both males and females fill this out. And they found that females actually rated themselves as having more severe autistic features than males. However, using an external score, and this was a clinical observation, the ADOS, which is what clinicians use to diagnose autism. It's a semi-structured um, observation, clinical observation where they're interacting with a clinician. The interesting thing they noted here was that females exhibited less severe social communication deficits than males, the same females that had rated themselves as feeling more severe. And so from this, they came up with this camouflaging score or discrepancy score. In 2017, they added to the internal score um, a, a different, another task called the reading the mind and the eyes task, where they had the individuals infer the mental status of, of people just based on looking at photos of their eyes. And they used this reading the minds and the eyes score plus the self-report of the autistic quotient to um, come up with this internal score. And here's the data from that paper. You can see the, uh, the red or pink circles are in um, are females with autism, the blue circles are male. And on average, uh, women had higher camouflaging scores than men. Than, than males. And this, I think, was one of the first papers to really study um, in a rigorous way, uh, showing that female, autistic females, compared to autistic males, um, displayed more camouflaging behaviors. Another way to measure camouflaging in autistic individuals is to use observational studies. 
Uh, this is measuring specific behaviors and experiences which represent camouflaging. And here I want to talk about a study that, that I, I think of as the playground study. This I think was a very clever design. Um, the researchers looked at elementary school playground behavior and they coded in one minute intervals uh, what the kids were doing during recess. And here we have a, the, the average age was about second grade for these kids, but it was all elementary. And they were observing children and they were coding uh, what the child was doing, doing during recess. So they coded either that the child was playing games. So these were structured games like handball, tetherball, or foursquare. Another option was coding that they were solitary, meaning that they were alone and not engaging with others. And then a third category was joint engaged. So this is when they were talking or actively socializing in small groups. They also looked at um, how the, the time was distributed during recess across these three different events. And this is a term that they called flitting. Um, looking at, you know, if, if kids spent uh, the, the amount of time they spent in each of these activities. And so what the study found is they just simply measured in minutes how, many, how much time the, the children spent in each of these activities. And that's what this chart here is. These are just um, simply kept tallying the number of minutes. And what you can see here, let me walk you through these results, that typically developing boys spent the vast majority of their time, uh, or the majority of their time uh, participating in structured play, so games uh, on the recess, uh, on the playground. In contrast, autistic, oops, autistic boys spent most of their time in solitary um, sort of play. So they were spent a lot of their time alone or engaged with the recess monitor, the adults on the playground. And in the discrepancy between TD boys and boys with autism was quite clear uh, that, that there was this difference in how they were behaving. However, in girls, the story was a little bit different. Here, both TD girls and girls with autism actually spent most of their time in this joint engage category of looking like they were socializing. I think it's important to note here though that uh, the second most common activity for girls with autism was this solitary play, but uh, the, the, they actually did spend most of their time in joint engagement. However, when they looked, the researchers looked at this flitting behavior. So how much, did how much did the children go between these different types of activities? What became apparent to them was that the girls with autism tended to flit between joint engage and solitary play, whereas the typically developing girls were flitting from one social group to another. So joint engage to joint engage. And so although if you just looked at their behavior, on the playground. It might look like all the girls were in these social groups. If you looked more closely, um, the girls with autism were going from social groups sort of on the outskirts of the social group to so so solitary play, and then may maybe going and joining the outskirts of another uh, social group. So I think that the, the study raised a couple important points. While autistic girls' social challenges were concealed from playground attendance, so the observers that were just coding how much time the children spent in these social groups didn't notice, um, or there wasn't a difference between how, how much time the girls were spending in this joint engaged type of play, these, um, these, the, their peers did notice. So these girls with autism, although they were trying to join these joint engaged groups, they were not being accepted into the peer groups. I think it's as important because if practitioners look only for social isolation on the playground when looking for children with social challenges, uh, the boys would stand out, but the girls would continue to be uh, left unidentified. So here in the second type of, of study, an observational study of playground behaviors, again, we're seeing that autistic girls used more comp compensatory behaviors to mask their social challenges than did boys. And then a third way that we measure camouflaging in autistic individuals, and these are a couple of recent papers, um, are to use quantitative self-reports. And the questionnaire that um, came out from Laura Hull and Will Mandy's group was called the Camouflaging Autistic Traits Questionnaire. This is a self-report. Um, it, was, it was tested and validated in a group of adults with autism as well, a large group of adults with autism, as well as non-autistic individuals. 
And this is 21 items on this self-report. And there were a number of questions targeting sort of different uh, strategies that you might be using during camouflaging. Compensation. I learned how people use their bodies and faces to interact by watching television or films or by reading fiction. And the, um, the person doing the questionnaire is just rating how likely they are to use these strategies, very likely or not likely at all. Uh, masking was another category of questions that they have on their questionnaire. I monitor my body language or facial expressions so that I appear interested by, in the person that I am interacting with. And then assimilation, a bunch of questions about assimilation. In social situations, I feel like I'm performing rather than being myself. And so in a study where they, uh, in, where they looked at autistic females versus autistic males, and then the non-autistic females and the non-autistic males, they found, and here uh, this graph just to orient you, the red line is the autistic group, the black line is the non-autistic group. We have female, male, and one thing that I liked about this study was they actually also looked at non-binary individuals. And on the y-axis here is the camouflaging score, the, the score that the individual got on the cat Q. And what you can see is that autistic females, again, had higher total camouflaging scores than autistic males. I guess that's, this is the comparison we're looking at here. Whereas non-autistic females and males did not differ. When they looked at the different subscales, so the masking, assimilation, and compensation subscale scores, they found that autistic females scored higher than autistic males on masking and assimilation, but not on compensation. And finally, there were no striking differences in the non-binary individuals, either with um, the other people within their diagnostic group or across um, the scores, uh, but they cautioned that the number of non-binary individuals was still quite small in this study. So there were 16 non-binary individuals in the autistic group and 27 in the non um, in the non-autistic group. So I think this finding um, needs a little bit more exploring. But uh, the take home message of this, this study is that using self assessment, adult autistic females report higher rates of masking and assimilation than autistic males. So another camouflaging measure that came out around the same time um, came out from Lucy Livingston and Francesca Hefe, and they focused more on the compensation component of camouflaging. So they have a compensation checklist. Um, this is a, a sort of an open-ended question, 31 questions looking at uh, these different types of strategies that individuals might be using. So, they here in this compensation checklist um, differentiate between shallow compensation methods versus deep compensation strategies. And so shallow compensation uh, strategies are sort of what I've been mentioning all along, strategies that enable the production of neurotypical social behavior without solving the cognitive dif dif difficulty differences. So things like copying gestures or using learned scripts. Um, they contrast this with the deep compensation strategies. And so these would be strategies where the individual can actually substitute the other, other's values with your own to infer their mental state. So this is theory of mind, um, for those of you who are familiar with that construct. These are strategies that enable an alternative route to solve the cognitive difficulty in question. And these deep compensation strategies are thought to be more flexible and adaptive, allowing for deeper social interactions. They also had some questions looking at masking. So again, these are holding back your true thoughts, dressing and speaking like the group you're trying to blend in with, and then looking at accommodation. So these are strategies where an indiv individual may actively seek out environments or peoples that are more accepting of somebody's uh, difficulties or strengths. And so here they used a, a sample, and I think this is interesting to note, they have 58 for this study, they looked for individuals uh, who self-identified as having autism or having problems with social interactions specifically. And they looked at individuals who were both diagnosed with autism and not diagnosed with autism, but all of the individuals reported having social difficulties. I think it's interesting to, report, to, to, to see here that we don't have uh, the typical imbalance that we would expect for the, the composition of the sample in this study. We actually have more females than males in the study in both the diagnosed and non-diagnosed group. So it's actually a relatively small sample of males. And what did they find? 
Um, well, the first finding was that regardless of diagnostic status, uh, participants tended to report strategies across multiple types rather than just from one strategy type alone. So they tended to use a mix of the shallow and deep compensation, the masking and accommodation. Um, here they found that diagnosed participants reported higher overall compensation scores than non-diagnosed participants. And in particular, this was due to an increase in shallow compensation strategies. So these individuals indeed who had the diagnosis perhaps had higher autism traits to begin with, um, or that, that diagnosis alone led them to, to compensate more for their social behaviors. However, in this study, they did not observe a gender difference between how males and females used the compensation strategies. Um, but again, I just want to point out that the number of males in this study was quite small, only 22 across both of the groups. So in this study, no gender difference was detected in the compensation scores, but it was potentially underpowered. So moving on, um, thinking about what the mental health consequences of camouflaging are. So I've been talking about, uh, it seems that uh, camouflaging is quite common in autistic individuals. What are the consequences of this? What do we need to think about that goes along with camouflaging? And these are a couple of quotes from a study conducted by Beck and uh, Michael South's group last year. I'm more worried about making a social mistake than dying. I was tired of trying to succeed socially and making social mistakes, so I started avoiding people. In the Beck study, this was a study of 58 autistic women, and they administered the CAT-Q, the Camouflaging Autism Traits Questionnaire, um, and found that higher scores were associated with higher levels of psychological distress. So they used various measures um, looking at depression, anxiety, and stress. Higher, the more you camouflage, the higher levels of uh, depression, anxiety, and stress they found in these individuals. Furthermore, when they distinguished um, two subgroups, a high camouflaging group versus a lower camouflaging group, so people who used more camouflaging strategies versus those who didn't use as many, they had more severe scores on measures of suicidality and reduced daily functioning. So I think this is really, really important to, to think about and consider when, um, when thinking about camouflaging in general for people with autism. In another study conducted by Cassidy et al. in 2018, they look now at a sample of both autistic males as well as autistic females. Um, here, going back to the gender difference question, uh, they didn't find a sex difference in reporting whether an individual engaged in camouflaging behavior. However, autistic women tended to report camouflaging across more situations, more frequently, and more of the time than autistic males. So this is again supporting that autistic females may be using cam camouflaging strategies more often than autistic males. Importantly, they were looking at uh, suicidality in, in a population of autistic individuals, and they found that camouflaging was a unique and independent risk factor for suicidality above and beyond the severity of autistic traits. Um, so the degree of camouflaging was an independent risk factor for suicidality in both autistic men and women. So I think it's really important because we think about camouflaging as a compensatory or a coping strategy, but these strategies may be coming at pretty high costs as well. So while camouflaging behaviors might be adaptive and facilitate social inclusion, people are really suffering. They can come at a cost of elevated psychological distress. So moving on to my comfort zone, which is looking at the brain. Um, what do we know about the neural basis of camouflaging? And here I think we are um, at our infancy. The entire field is really getting started. Um, but there have been two studies looking at associations with camouflaging and different ways of looking at the brain. And both of these are conducted by Meng Chuan Lai. Um, the first study, this is in that same 2017 paper, he looked at brain structure. So this is now just um, taking a snapshot of the brain and then measuring how big things are. So he was looking at associations between gray matter volume and the camouflaging score. So this is back to his discrepancy score. Uh, in 30 autistic males and 30 autistic females, these are again adults, um, what he found was that highlighted in red here are regions in the left medial temporal lobe as well as the cerebellum 
in which um, increased camouflaging scores were associated with decreased gray matter volume in females, but not males. The blue regions are regions where camouflaging scores were associated with decreased volume in females overall. The red regions are where it was different in males. And so this is suggesting that there are sex differences. Um, the, the brains of men and women with autism are different in how they're relating to these camouflaging uh, scores. When Ming Chuan and his colleagues used a program called Neurosyn to try to understand the functions that these brain regions might be carrying out, um, they, they came up with these. So this, this program, Neurosynth, works. You put in your brain map, and it, um, it looks at all of the different uh, studies, published studies, and looks for terms that had the highest mention in relation to the regions that are showing up on your brain map. And so this is just a word cloud of the different uh, functions that are associated with these brain regions that have a sex difference uh, in associations with camouflaging. So these are sort of um, words that you can think about in, in relation to camouflaging, remaining neutral, uh, fear, fate, uh, faces, encoding, anxiety. These are words that sort of make sense when you're thinking about camouflaging and indeed map onto the brain as well. Mentron and his colleagues also did a, follow this up with a, a functional brain study. So now instead of looking at just how big is the brain, they're looking at what is the brain doing during um, tasks that are associated with uh, cognitive processes that may be associated with camouflaging. And so here they looked at mentalizing and self-representation. So basically you have somebody lying in an MRI scanner and they're being asked to make um, reflective judgments. So they're just being asked these questions and they're thinking about this in the scanner. And there were four types of questions asked. There was mentalizing versus physical. So these are questions like how likely are you to think that keeping a diary is important? So you're doing a mentalizing activity here versus physical. How likely are you to have bony elbows? You're simply making a physical judgment versus a mentalizing judgment. They also had self versus other questions. Um, self is how likely are you to think that keeping a diary is important? And other would be how likely is someone else? How likely is the queen to think that keeping a diary is important? These are British researchers. Um, and then they looked at two different brain regions that have been associated with more mentalizing versus physical types of judgments. So this is the right temporal parietal junction. Previous studies have shown um, greater activity in this region when an individual is doing a mentalizing sort of judgment versus a physical judgment. And then they also looked at the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which has been shown to have stronger activity when you're making reflections about yourself versus making reflections about others. And in this study, uh, he found that autistic, they, he, basically he found sex differences in how the brain was activating in, in relation to these two different types of tasks, these types of questions. Autistic men had less activation in both regions compared to neurotypical men. That's sort of what you would just predict um, based on what we know about autism. However, autistic females did not show these same differences relative to neurotypical females. And in fact, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex activity, this self versus other region, was associated with higher camouflaging scores in autistic females, but not in autistic males. So again, additional evidence suggesting that there may be brain differences, um, sex differences in how the brain is doing camouflaging um, in, in a very basic sort of way. So, um, in this very short amount of time, I hope I've given you an overview to some of the questions that I posed at the beginning. Uh, what is camouflaging? It's a set of coping strategies used to put on one's best normal, whatever that is. Uh, how do we measure it? We have several different ways in the field that people are measuring camouflaging, discrepancy scores, observational studies, and self-report. Um, what do we know about sex and gender differences in camouflaging? Well, we have some evidence uh, that autistic females camouflage more, but certainly we know that autistic males also camouflage, and there is this, I think, question is still um, an open question. We would like to have more evidence showing this. We do know that there are mental health consequences to camouflaging, so we need to pay attention to that as a field and as clinicians. Um, and finally, that we, there's some inkling of neural basis of some of the cognitive processes 
that might be underlying how people compensate and camouflage. So I just want to end with some challenges that uh, face the field as scientists we're always striving to improve on our studies. Um, I think it's important to note that thus far a lot of the studies that have been conducted, the ones I talked about today, have been convenient samples. So a lot of these have been studies where um, individuals have been recruited through social media ads or just advertisements. A lot of these studies were conducted online. And so these are people who have access to computers who are um, perhaps more highly literate or more highly skilled. And we don't really know how representative the existing samples are um, to the entire population of, of an individual with autism. So it might be difficult to generalize these findings and it would be helpful to compare to more non-autistic or neurotypical samples. Um, I think it's also important that these studies, to, to think that these studies have been done in adults. So there are challenges to adult diagnoses, and many of these can be confounded by the presence of co-occurring psychiatric symptoms like anxiety, ADHD, and depression that we know occur at higher rates in individuals with autism. So it's difficult to attribute camouflaging directly to autism when individuals may also have these co-occurring psychiatric symptoms. It's hard to tease that apart. And finally, um, some, uh, a recent editorial by Eric Flambone has raised questions about the validity of how we measure camouflaging. Um, in particular, for discrepancy scores, I think it's very difficult to accurately gauge somebody's internal autistic state, um, particularly through things like self-report. It would be nice to have a biomarker or some sort of implicit task that um, shows what this internal autistic state is, but we don't have that yet. Um, observational studies depend on a non-autistic observer's idea of what camouflaging is. So we may have no idea what the autistic uh, individual is actually doing or thinking they're doing um, in these sorts of observational studies. And finally, construct validity of the self-report measures. We have to figure out exactly what we're measure measuring in these self-report measures and try to map them onto cognitive processes in the brain. I think we have a lot of really exciting future directions um, to go in. Uh, one thing I thought might be interesting to discuss in the Q&A session is, do we need to rethink the term camouflaging? So some people have reported that they feel that there's some stigma associated with this notion of camouflaging, that there may be this idea that there's an intentional deception going on and maybe that's a bad thing. Um, some people in the field uh, are thinking about using the, you know, dropping the term camouflaging and using the term uh, social coping strategies as an alternative. Um, future directions that I'm interested in are looking at the, as I said, the neural and cognitive mechanisms associated with these coping strategies. And then thinking about the mental health uh, consequences of camouflaging, I think it's really important to think about providing wraparound services to support and prevent mental health issues that may arise from interventions that involve camouflaging efforts. So we recognize that people are camouflaging, how can we support them better and recognize the, their need, their unmet needs. And finally, I think another exciting opportunity is to look at developmental trajectories of camouflaging. Um, the studies I reported today are all in adults with autism. We don't really, we haven't really tried to measure this um, in younger, at least with the self-report assessments in younger individuals and really do a, a, a good comparison to neurotypical peers. Because as I said in the beginning, I think camouflaging is something that everybody does, um, but we just need to parse out the degree uh, that, that people with autism might be doing it differently. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And um, just, this is my daughter, Clara, down here. Uh, that is on the GAIN website as well. Um, thank you so much for your attention and I will open it to questions. Thank you so much, Christine. We're getting some really great questions and your talk about um, considering whether camouflaging is the right kind of way to describe this has come up where people have suggested that maybe that's putting the impetus on the person is having to hide when really maybe it's our societal expectations. And someone even asked, is masking the same thing? When you talk about masking, is that the same as camouflaging? Well, I think about masking as a, uh, or, well, we as a field <laughs> think about masking as, as one of the strategies that, that we use to camouflage. And 
Um, you know, I've, I've been trying to not use the term camouflaging also because I think it's a very difficult word to spell and I spell it wrong. All the I time. found that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after this presentation, I think I've got it. Um, but uh, no, masking, I think, is a, a strategy that um, just, just simply one of the strategies, strategies that we think about in social coping. And so people were wanting to think about how much this camouflaging is really late related more to um, our cultural expectations of gender norms, if there have been any studies about this kind of phenomenon in autism across different cultures. To my knowledge, there hasn't been yet, but I think that's a really, really interesting question. There are so many cultural differences, I think not only in thinking about gender differences, but just autism in general, um, what, what different cultures expectations are. But I think in particular, looking at gender differences would be very interesting in cultures who have very strong uh, differences in expectations and gender. But we haven't done those studies yet. And I think it's important that that, that's, that should be on my future directions as well. There you go. Well, we also had uh, several questions thinking about gender identity and camouflaging in autism and whether most of these studies have been done with cisgender people um, yeah. and sort of if we have many studies about this intersectionality. Yeah, I think that's another area where we have to do a lot more work is looking at transgender issues and autism and differences both behaviorally as well as in the brain, I think, um, of, of what may be underlying and different mechanisms there. But I, I did want to, that's why I brought it up in the, um, the first Hall and Mandy study where they tested the CAT-Q where they actually did ask for gender identity status, but there just wasn't a large enough sample yet to, to make any strong conclusions. But I think that's a really interesting and a necessary issue to explore. Since you brought up the CAT-Q, someone asked what a high score on the CAT-Q is. What number would be a high score? Oh, um, you know, I don't know exactly what the cutoff is on, on that. And so here I'm just looking at the mean CAT Q scores and it looks like the score for the total score for autistic women was about 125, although I haven't looked exactly at the scoring and, and how in the manual for, for this measure yet, but that might give you a reference point here. About 125 was the total score in autistic females and it looks like maybe around 90 for, for autistic males. Thank you. So another kind of series of questions that has come up is around how camouflaging or you know, coping might uh, occur differently in people of different ages, in girls with different intellectual disabilities, and if that's been studied. Yeah, so that hasn't been studied. I, I threw on um, at the end there, for any of you guys looking at, at your Padlets, I, I I cheated and I tweaked my slides and I added one more study onto my future directions, which is this um, Jorgensen study. And this is the one study thus far that has looked at developmental trajectories and camouflaging. So here they actually looked at a younger group of adolescents. They looked at 13 to 18 year olds and uh, they, they then broke that up into early adolescents and late adolescents. Um, and I'm going to not tell you the exact um, <laughs> findings because I'm going to get it wrong, but um, basically there were differences in uh, how individuals um, used these strategies over time. So differences between early adolescents and later adolescents, as well as gender differences is here. And I apologize that I don't have a slide on that study, um, but I think that it's a really important topic to look at the development of how these coping strategies are coming about in, in individuals who have been diagnosed as children. So some of the um, criticisms of some of the studies that focus on adult samples is that these are adult diagnoses and they're very tricky to do. You would know much better than I would, Aubin. Um, so it would be valuable to have a cohort of individuals who were diagnosed as children and follow them longitudinally. And we happen to have a cohort here at the Mind Institute, the GAIN study. And so as we um, follow these girls, this cohort of girls and boys with autism into middle childhood and adolescence, we certainly intend to look at um, how these coping strategies are developing 
and how it will be related to the onset of psychiatric co-occurring psychiatric symptoms like anxiety, um, as well as autism severity. Yeah, so and that, that the plans. Is, goes with a lot of questions people have of what kind of strategies are then leading to mental health challenges. And are there, you know, any, has there been any, I know this is a really new line of research, so we're asking questions probably that we just don't know the answer to yet, but are there any studies that either are qualitatively kind of ask women how they're feeling, how they're camouflaging, and anything that's looked at ways to help girls and women cope. Parents are asking sort of, how can I help my daughter not have to camouflage or not in ways that don't lead to mental health challenges? Exactly, I think, um, so, so the one paper I would recommend, and I think it's in the Padlet, is the Beck paper, Michael South. They, and, and I think as a group of researchers, I think it's very important to think about the subjective experiences. What are the lived experiences of people? Listen to people with autism. Um, that's a message to all researchers. We need to listen to the people um, that have autism and um, try to help them. As far as strategies, you know, I, I think that we still have a ways to go, but I think uh, if we can recognize that that there are these mental health consequences to coping that's the first step so even though somebody looks good they may be feeling really bad and how can we help and there are treatments for anxiety um, and depression and things like that and maybe we need to focus on that and not just think of it all as autism but really trying to treat these different symptoms differently I'm going to give you a brain question, Christine, so you can have an <laughs> intervention break. Um, someone's asking, given the results of the fMRI study that didn't show significant differences between the female autistic and neurotypical brains, um, does that possibly mean women with autism are using the same brain areas and cognitive abilities as neurotypical women to make social adjustments? Might there be differences in presentation? So I think that's, um, that's one interpretation of that result. And I think for me as a, as a female, as a woman, I think that um, you know, when I talk to my camouflaging colleagues, I think, well, this is something women just do. Um, and I, this is being broadcast on Facebook, but just to say <laughs> that I think this is something that maybe all women do more than men um, because of the gender expectations, because of the norms and the culture that we live in. And so I think that Perhaps what one interpretation of that finding is that um, neurotypical women are also camouflaging. And so therefore, maybe this is one area where um, there are just cognitive processes that are related to being a woman um, and the things that you have to do that don't necessarily differentiate um, across diagnoses. And I think that's, that's a really interesting thing. But I think that, that more studies are needed um, to compare autistic women to neurotypical women and autistic men to neurotypical men because we know that neurotypical men and neurotypical women aren't necessarily the same. So we need to look at um, the comparison of uh, these, what I call these, these sex-related, sex-specific typically developing peers to, to compare to. Well, I know intervention is not your area, but we have a lot of really interesting discussion in the Q&A about whether, especially in early intervention, we're teaching kids camouflaging strategies. I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Um, I might shoot that to you, Aubin. This is your <laughs> area of expertise. But I thought that was something when I was reading these papers, I was like, wow, you know, some of these strategies are exactly what we're teaching these kids to do. And so this is where I think that wraparound support for the mental health consequences could be really important in adding on to the interventions um, while we're teaching kids to to cope. I mean, these are coping strategies that people use, um, not only people with autism, but we need to be aware of it and help them. But I don't know, I, I would, can I ask you what you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question for boys and for girls, right? Because certainly uh, as kids are learning to interact socially at school, we're teaching them strategies to try to fit in, right? Um, I think, um, there are also strategies for coping, strategies for better communication and understanding that aren't necessarily camouflaging. Um, but I do think we need to be thinking about that as we are learning more about the concept of neurodiversity and infusing that in early intervention and being careful that we are teaching kids um, skills that are gonna support them in 
interacting with other people in ways that fit with their personality and their needs, not just fit with sort of the neurotypical norm. And, and hopefully that's part of universal design for learning and inclusion for, for everyone. So all of us don't have to camouflage as much, but I do think it's something early intervention hasn't traditionally been thinking about and, and traditionally have has done and hopefully that'll shift. Yeah, and I just add that I think the accommodation is also something that's changing. So um, making the workplace more inviting, accommodating different you know, neurodiverse strategies. We, there are more and more autistic individuals working in research labs now, and um, maybe we need to change our expectations and, and accommodate their difficulties and have them not have to camouflage um, and use these strategies more. I think that's, that's on the horizon as well.